Good morning, everyone. To start with, you said 20 years. It's actually 25 years, so I'm five years older than what she thought. <laughs> so I am Sushmita. I am a partner with Deloitte India Consulting, and I work in the analytics, AI, and data practice. So my work spans across data engineering, data modernization engagements, enterprise-wide insights dashboarding, AI ML model development, and robotic process automation, and many others. I have been in this field for about 25 years now, and you can start calculating my age from here. So my day-to-day -day job is to analyze all the plethora of the variety of new technologies that we have today. It's an ever-growing and ever-progressing field. And my job is to advise and consult my clients on the best technologies they could implement in their business to transform and innovate their business, and which would give them a competitive edge in the marketplace. However, I am not from a technology background. I am not an engineer. I come from an economics, political science, and statistics background. How I ended up in this world of tech is by chance, and now it is my choice. And I love this field that I work in. So today, I am going to share some of my life experiences with you, some simple and humble stories which got me here. And I am not going to go, go too technology heavy, because many of you might be knowing much more than I have. But uh, here we start with some of the life lessons that I picked up which helped me traverse through this world. The first one, think and create. My learning started uh, very early on in my life. Maybe that time I did not even realize that, and now I'm connecting practically the dots backwards. So at the age of five, I would love painting, I would love colors, and my parents appointed an art teacher for me. And he is the most creative people that I've met in my life till today. None of those art classes would be about uh, coloring within the lines or drawing techniques. He would just scribble something on the paper and tell me, make an animal out of it. Or he would give me a piece of red paper and say, build a Santa Claus, and now make its hands move. So to me, those were fun times, but sometimes I would say, sir, I don't know how to do this. So he would say, think. Think how you can do it. And he would just not take no for an answer. And this training continued for the next eight years, where I was trained to think and create. So I was making uh, flowers out of ribbons, and houses out of shoeboxes, and dinosaurs out of uh, you know, used bottles and cans. So that was the first one. Then I went on to do my uh, graduation in economics. Then I joined JNU for my master's, and I moved to Delhi. And there I received what I consider the most pivotal lesson in my life. Every time, how can I be better than myself? It was during the first final semester, first year final semester, Dr. Deepak Nair would be teaching us development economics. It was a difficult subject. The paper was really hard, but I fared extremely well and my grades were significantly higher than most of my classmates. It was a very proud moment for me. So all my friends were pepping me up, and I was like on cloud nine. Then the class asked for a retest, because the marks were very average. So our professor very graciously agreed, and he said it's not mandatory, 
So if you want to take the test, you can. If you don't want to, it's up to you. So I was almost on the verge of arrogance. I walked up to my professor and said, uh, sir, my marks are pretty OK, so I don't think I need to take the test. And I was expecting all sorts of appreciation and accolades from him, saying, Sushmita, you have done really well, etc. Nothing of that sort happened. He looked at me with a frown. He was very disappointed, annoyed. And he told me, you think you cannot do better than this? And you don't even want to try? If you want to succeed in life, you better get your attitude right, young lady. I did not know how to react to it. It was a jolt for me. But I absorbed that learning. And that stayed with me till date. So everything I do, it's like, how can I do it better the next time? How can I keep improving, improving more? I think the world of technology is also similar. Today, something is new. Tomorrow, something better comes up. Day after, it is something next generation. So we always have to keep up, keep improving ourselves, and keep up with the pace of technology. And that's the spirit of this world of technology today. During my master's, I got married at the age of 21. I started working in Delhi as a research associate. My first introduction to analytics and technology happened when I joined GE Capital, which now you know as many of you might know as GenPact. It was GE Capital International Services then, two decades ago. And I was told that I have to uh, model data and recognize patterns out of it. But I cannot see the data. And that utterly confused me. How can I even analyze something which I'm not seeing? And I was told that millions of records are sitting on the server somewhere. You cannot download that. That's when I started learning about servers, databases, data dictionary, SAS, SQL. So technology was needed to do my job. And I gradually started understanding technology and how it can be combined with analytics and the power technology can have. So I would analyze the data, and then I was supposed to build an Excel report out of it. This Excel report had 40 tabs. Each tab would have about 50 columns. And for 20 days in a month, I was copy-pasting, copy-pasting, copy-pasting numbers. I would make 100 mis mistakes, fix them, and make 50 more. Two months, I realized this cannot be it. I cannot do this, because this is not productive. How can I do it better? Is there a way out? I started reaching out to my friends. One friend then taught me Excel macros, VBA. It was like magic to me. A little program reduced five hours of my work. I started programming, and gradually those 20 days came down to two hours. And I felt even lazier. I scheduled all the jobs on the server, and my, I won't call it man hours, woman hours were zero. So then I was enjoying my life. Three, four days I got bored because I had no work. I walked up to my manager and asked for more work. But that taught me the power of automation. And again, how technology can enable our day-to-day -day jobs. After GE, I moved on to Symphony Services. There, I learned about automated modeling. I learned about how analytics services could be packaged into software and deployed at the client's end. So in the course, I picked up .NET, I picked up Java, I picked up uh, testing tools, and many others. 
but my mind was full of ideas, full of new things that I wanted to try. So one day, I went back home and told my husband that I want to start my own firm. That time, I had just received a promotion. My daughter was three years old. We had just bought a house. I was very happy with my job. It was my comfort zone. It was a cushioned job and my salary was not insignificant. So I debated and debated, but those thoughts of doing something new will just not leave me. And then I came to the third learning in my life. That's my family out there. My daughter is a teenage daughter. I see technology through her eyes now. It's a different world. So my husband told me, very simply, uh, simply and very simple words. If you want to do something, you have to give it a try. If you try, it might happen, it might not happen. But if you don't try, it will never happen. So it was a binary choice. And that gave me the courage. And to me, you know, the interpretation of that learning was that whether my company is successful or not, that won't be my failure. If I don't try, that is going to be my failure. So I registered my company and started a technology-enabled analytics firm. Equipped with these uh, three learnings, these helped me immensely to break a lot of barriers to challenge a lot of myths, some knowingly, some unknowingly, but I was breaking the boxes. And I'm going to talk to some of them today. We almost always maybe put ourselves in one box or the other. Am I a techie? Am I not, not techie? Man, woman box, either it is family or it is work. However, to me, none of these are either or. They are all and options. Why can't we have it all? And why can't we figure out ways to do it? Coming to the first myth, I don't hear it very often now, but I used to hear it, that women cannot make it big in tech. Or can women make it big in tech? Is it a man world? Is it a woman world? A little trip down history. I know many of you already know these people, these seminal women out there, but still I cannot go without uh, talking about them because they are huge inspirations for me. Ada Lovelace, she was the world's first computer programmer and that happened in 1833. She was the daughter of the famous poet Lord Byron and might have picked up some of the geniusness from her father. She was working with Charles Babbage when he was building his analytical engine. By the way, they did not receive funding for their analytical engine, so they could not finish that work. But that was the inception of computers. And Ada Lovelace had the vision and she would do all these complex mathematical programs. And she had the vision that these programs, these mathematical programs, could tell a machine what to do. And that was the start, and this is way back in 1833. In fact, in the uh, 1950s and 1960s, most of the computer programmers were women. Another example is Grace Hopper. She, during the 1950s, she used to work much more in, uh, in the computer, in the IT information area. She's an admiral with United States Navy. She was the one who had the groundbreaking idea that programs could be written in English words. And it was no longer that someone had to be a mathematician to start programming. The world of programming practically opened up to everyone. 
And by the way, she is the one who uh, coined the phrase debugging. There was a little uh, bug which got caught in her computer and impeded its operations. And from there she said, let's uh, debug. And that's where the world picked up that word phrase now. That was history. In today's world, there are so many examples and maybe so many of you here out today. These women are the most powerful in the tech world today, in the modern tech world. And I could fill up slides after slides with these, uh, with more beautiful faces. They are CXOs, they are business leaders, they are entrepreneurs, they are technology innovators. They come from different countries, various backgrounds. They are engineers, they are mathematicians, they are scientists from psychology, from law and from business. So the list is endless, the roles are endless, the sk skill needs today are endless. And all of us can have a place in this world of tech. However, it has not been easy for any of them. It needs determination and grit. And that goes, I don't think, only for women, for men as well. Just looking at these pictures, I am nowhere close to what some of these astonishing women have achieved. But little experience from my life. When I had my own firm, to get that first client was very difficult. To make someone believe in what you believe in was very difficult. I was at a client office from 9 in the morning till 9 o'clock in the night, I was waiting at the reception and I was not even allowed inside their office. I was asked to come back the next day. I went back, I sat there for five hours, no meeting. I went back again the next day. It went on for some time till they signed a very small deal with us. And we were very happy and we worked really hard. Gradually, we grew within their company and they became our reference clients. However, at that time, I did not have any mon money. I did not have any funding. I was rejected by two investors saying, your ideas are not convincing enough. But I needed a team, I needed computers, I needed software, hardware, printers, conference lines, I needed an office space. I needed security guard. <laughs> so I needed all that to really start making my company work. I could not go to best of the schools to hire. So my small team came from very remote corners of the country. There were few people who had worked with me before. They believed in me and joined me. But many people or some people came from very remote corners. There were engineers, there was a designer, there was a person with a history background, there was a person with an accountancy background. But all of us had one common thing. The opportunity we got, we wanted to utilize it to the fullest. And we were all passionate about proving ourselves. So we would ideate, we would brainstorm, and some of the most brilliant ideas actually came from non-technical backgrounds because they had the domain expertise. They had seen business, and they could associate those business processes, they could associate those functional specs. And then our team started building what I had always wanted to do was an automated modeling platform. My little firm was then acquired by an US analytics firm. My team was absorbed with all our capabilities that we had built. And we further enhanced and developed that platform. And that changed the business model of the acquiring firm. We could do larger projects. We could do uh, much deeper projects. We could derive granular insights. We could 
analyze big data. That platform would churn out thousands of models within a few hours, which were humanly impossible. And we would analyze some of those models, and the improvements we saw, we would quote that back into the platform. Little did I know that we were actually building a very close to what we now call as an MLOps platform. Given this, I come to the second myth. The only job for women in tech are as engineers. By this time, I learned that this is the greatest misnomer. We need so many skill sets, we, need, we have so many roles. It's a world out there for all of us to take advantage, come, from, come with various ideas, very innovative thinking, which could make any technology engagement actually successful. It requires data analysts, business analysts, domain experts, visualization experts. It, it just needs every skill set. It needs a huge skilled workforce, which we women can add to. This world of technology now, to me, it is not only about a few programs. It is about human-centric design. It's about behavioral learning. It's about user experience. We need practitioners to understand business processes. We need them to do the functional spec. We need them to do the technical spec. Technology today touches everything, and everything is becoming tech. So the spe spectrum is very, very broad. The last myth. And this is a question I get very often, and most often. Work-life balance. How do we balance family with work and a progressive career, per se? And I completely understand and agree that uh, it is more demanded from women to be socially integrated. And I, per se, I would never want to miss on any family vacation, any weddings, all anniversaries, birthday parties, I have to attend, because I love doing that, spending time with family. So how do we do it? There is no straight answer for me. But again, maybe taking a leaf from history, the colored picture that you see is of Dame Stephanie Shirley, she started a software freelance company, and the business model was very woman-centric. Most of the employees were women, and they would have a work-from-home option, and they would have flexible work hours. And the black and white picture is of Anne Moffat. Anne Moffat was on Dame Shirley's team, and she is seen here, this is a famous picture. She is seen here programming the black box flight recorder of Concord from her kitchen table while her five-year-old daughter looks on. This is a very symbolic picture, and I think the symbolism and the implication of this picture stands still today. And remembering from my past when I was a senior consultant, a huge project came in. It required a big team to achieve that project. And I was the only girl. And this team would be working grueling hours very late into the night, sometimes till 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. So my manager was very generous, and he said, Sushmita, you can leave at uh, 6 p.m., 7 p.m. if you want to. You, can, you need not stay back. But I felt that. I felt left out, and I felt that I was losing on performance, because while all my teammates were working, I was at home. But then when I was at home, I would return at 6 o'clock, but my mind wouldn't stop thinking. I think somewhere that five years training kicked back. And I would think of ideas and solutions, and when I was cooking or my masala was frying, I was jotting down those ideas on a piece of paper. 
it was not taxing on me because I loved doing it. I loved my job and that is where I wanted to be. The team was working late in the night, so they would come in late in the morning. So I started going a little early to office. And those few morning peaceful hours that I would get, I would start clearing the backlog and I would start implementing some of the ideas which I had jotted down the previous night. And soon I was appointed the team lead of that project. So maybe some of the, uh, one answer I give to this work-life balance is, all of us have 24 hours. If we can use some of those hours a little bit more creatively, and if we are passionate about our job, we are not forced to use those hours productively. So that is where I see myself. And today, after two decades or 25 years, I no longer think myself as an engineer or non-engineer, as a woman in tech. I'm just passionate about my job. And we all need good people and the skilled workforce to come together to make the world of technology a whole. Thank you.